Are you looking for a different level of truth about your challenges and struggles? Then be a part of the Yes And podcast, hosted by empowerment strategist and trauma specialist, Jennifer Whitaker. Every Wednesday, we challenge conventional thinking on topics like trauma, healing, and so much more. Learn life lessons and great nuggets of wisdom from guests who've moved through their pain and suffering to discover a new purpose in life. Now, here's your host, Jennifer Whitaker. Hi, everyone. This is Jennifer Whitaker, and you are watching or listening to yet another episode of Yes And. And if you're interested in learning more about Yes And or learning more about me and my strategy program and what I do to help people, please check out my website, jenniferwhitaker.com. Um, there's a podcast page. There's a page about my empowerment strategy program. And that's my one-stop shop where you can learn everything about me. Today's guest is Rabbi Elon Glazer. And Rabbi Elon is passionate about ending the stigma of addiction in the Jewish world and helping Jews in recovery and their loved ones find recovery and serenity one day at a time. He believes that life is a beautiful journey of learning and growth, suffering can be transformed into joy, and everyone is a miracle. Rabbi Elon is the author of the number one best-selling book, And God Created Recovery, Jewish Wisdom to Help You Break Free from Your Addiction, Heal Your Wounds, and Unleash Your Inner Freedom. He's the founder of Our Jewish Recovery and a Shatterproof Ambassador and Family Program Instructor, a member and director at large of the National Speakers Association's DC chapter, Rabbi Elon teaches widely about healing, recovery, grief and mourning, happiness, spirituality, and success in all areas of life. Rabbi Elon is a freelance recovery and transformation coach, an accomplished storyteller and music, musician, and the host of the Torah of Life podcast. He lives in Silver Spring, Maryland with his wife, Sherry, and their cat, Taylor. Rabbi Elon, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, this is such an important topic to have, uh, such an important discussion. Um, and I'd, um, I'd like to start out, if you're open to it, just hearing a little bit about your story, because I know that you have your own journey of recovery. Are, are you willing to share a little bit about, oh, sure, absolutely. about your story? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So my story is a little bit different than many other stories that are, that are in the news today. Today, we hear a lot about alcohol and we hear a lot about drugs. And those are sort of, I don't want to say the typical, you know, addiction recovery stories we're hearing today. And that's not my story, right? There are many different ways that people can become addicted to things. And my story is a little unique. So when I, when I was young, my, my father was also a rabbi and he was a congregational rabbi. So we moved every couple of years to different synagogues for him to work. And my mother was a Jewish day school teacher and principal. And I would say their marriage was not always the happiest, and she had a lot of medical challenges, was in and out of hospitals really since even before I was born, and struggled with, with, with five different rounds of cancer and a couple of liver transplants, and just it was, it was not an easy life for her or for, for either of them, really. And I was the second of four, and I, I fell into the, the stereotypical middle child role of caretaking and being in charge of, you know, helping out even from a young age with the laundry and the cleaning and the cooking and helping with my younger siblings, mm -hmm. later on teaching my mother's classes when she would go into the hospital and, and filling in at the synagogue and, and being very responsible on the outside and on the inside, there were, there were lots of problems. So one of the things I learned my mother was a professional baker on the side, and she was really, really good. She was very talented. Mm -hmm. When I, for example, had my bar mitzvah, and, and for my siblings as well, you know, because you know we were the rabbi's kids, we had to invite the whole congregation. There were 750 people who came Saturday morning, and a, a big dinner on Friday night, and a party Saturday night, and a brunch on Sunday morning. And she did the desserts for the entire weekend, right? Oh she would just bake for months at a time and filled up everybody's freezers. And she was, she was really, really good. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, unfortunately, one of the things that I learned, right, there really wasn't space for me to share my own thoughts and feelings and my own struggles with what was happening with mom's health, with dad's career, with just growing up as a young child. I mean, there were, right, it, it, we all need outlets for, you know, to be able to share things. And I didn't really have that. And one of the things I learned from her was that there was no emotion that couldn't be solved with the right amount of sugar. Ah. <laughs> You're you're familiar with this. I think we all have that grandma, right? (laughs) Right. Right. There's no emotion that can't be solved with the right amount of sugar. So if you're sad, have a cookie. If you're mad, have a brownie. If you're really ticked off, bake something and then share it. And there was almost always desserts in the house. And I became very good at baking them myself Mm -hmm. and eating them. And the truth is, when I ate them, I felt better. Mm-hmm. for a time yes. right and then the sugar high would wear off and i would feel worse and i'd have to eat more of them to feel better again mm-hmm. and then of course the other problem was that i gained weight because i was eating all of these desserts and i was the one who would finish everybody's meal at the table because there were starving children in africa so we shouldn't <laughs> waste food yes. how my eating more would help them i never quite understood but doesn't matter yeah same here right? <laughs> <laughs> so I I started gaining weight and then I'd get yelled at for gaining weight. You don't want to get fat like your father, do you? Well, of course, my only solution to feeling sad was to eat more. So the cycle just compounded. Mm-hmm. Right? And for many, many, many years, I mean, this started probably when I was five and and continued for decades. And then later on, it, it came time for dating and romance and hormones. And I didn't know anything about that. My parents certainly never, never taught me about that in a healthy way. And their, their, their marriage was, was not the happiest. And I was aware of their struggles and, and, you know, young boys who are in classes with all the other boys who are talking about girls will want to talk about girls too. But I was, you know, I was afraid, you know, nobody was ever going to like me. Why would, why would they? Right. I felt because I had so much, because I got yelled at so often at home for doing things or not doing things. I felt like most of the problems at home were my fault. Right. And that wasn't true. I wasn't responsible for my mother's illness. I wasn't responsible for their anger at each other and at the communities and, and their sadness around having to move. Like that wasn't anything that I, you know, I was along for the ride. I was a young kid. Of course that wasn't my fault. But at the time, what I thought was that since I was yelled at so often and I lived in fear of being yelled at, I thought that if only I could possibly contort myself into the right place and person and be better then they wouldn't have a reason to yell at me ergo it was my fault and I needed to do better Mm -hmm. right yeah and And I think I think that really resonates with so many of us whether it's eating or not that we're addicted to that contorting ourselves into what we think other people want us to be for sure oh that Uh, really resonates thank you for sure Mm -hmm. and I was a total people pleaser and I was looking for validation all the time right because i was incredibly insecure about my own self and i didn't really you know i had so many struggles and i got yelled at so much that i never really developed a sense of just being okay in my own skin as it were in fact right one of the things i also did is i you know i i i i I would pick at my skin and i would pull at my eyebrows and i would chew on my cheeks and and do damage to myself physically Mm -hmm. and i really was not comfortable in my own skin and and that too is an addiction yes and i've had to work on that one as well and then again when it came time to dating what i learned from my mother is that my job in life was to find a nice jewish woman put her on a pedestal and give her everything that she possibly wants because men are jerks (laughs) I, I'm not sure that that's just a, a in the Jewish community. I think For that's, sure not. I'm pretty For sure that's sure universal. <laughs> right. And, and, and I, I, that's what I yeah. thought. 
And so from a very young age, I can remember even when I was 12 and 13 and later on, looking for this woman to put on a pedestal, mm -hmm. right? As if I knew anything about what the healthy romance could be. Again, I didn't learn that from my parents. Their marriage was not, was not happy mm -hmm. much of the time. And I would, you know, someone would say something nice to me and I would light up and I'd, I'd think, oh, are you the one that I'm supposed to put on a pedestal because you're a nice person mm -hmm. at the age of 12, right? I mean, that's, that's <laughs> crazy yeah. looking back on it, but mm -hmm. I didn't know any better. And I, and at the same time, I was afraid of the actual encounters, right? What do you say to someone? How do you go from, I think you're cute to, can we go out to, will you marry? Like I didn't, <laughs> like, right? right? And I certainly <laughs> wasn't going to bring anyone home to the house because home wasn't safe either. Right. <laughs> and I, you know, I went to bed as a kid and I was overweight and I had asthma and like I was you know, I felt, again, awkward in my own skin. And, you know, it just, you know, when it came time to dating, I was watching my classmates have some attempts at that. And they were having girlfriends and what was wrong with me mm -hmm. that I couldn't. And then in eighth grade, we moved to London, Ontario, Canada for a couple of years. And I was in a mm -hmm. school there. And I, I still remember the day where I and the other guys from my class, we were, we were out in the schoolyard. I don't know if it was recess or after school. And somebody went to go throw something out in the trash can. And as they looked into the trash can, I guess they glanced over and they saw that there was a pornographic magazine in the trash can. And they took it out and brought it over. And as young pubescent boys will do, everybody oohed and odd. And at some point it went, tossed back into the trash can and everyone who went home except I went back to the trash can and took it out and took the magazine home with me mm -hmm. because well a I, I enjoyed <laughs> what I was seeing mm -hmm. but also it was easier to think about in, it was easier to think that perhaps you know the women in the magazine somehow cared for me in some mm -hmm. fantasy way than to have to actually think about talking to women I knew and figuring out how to date and how to struggle with with that mm -hmm. right? and pornography became a teacher of mine as it were and and that continued for many years as well yeah and again and, you are not alone in that um, I've dated men who've learned about relationships through point out pornography and oh dear God. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, as it turns out, the things you see in pornography are not entirely healthy. Or realistic. <laughs> or realistic. And, and why doesn't everybody look like the women who look like, you know, in, in those films? And, mm -hmm. and why doesn't, you know, every sexual encounter look like what happens in the, in the movies, right? Uh, right. <laughs> uh, of course, it's all filmed and it's Hollywood right. and it's not real. But somehow I felt like at least I wasn't hurting anyone. And at least, right, it, it, it gave me some semblance of connection to my own physical self, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't healthy, but it was something, mm -hmm. right? And, and I used to, when I was in high school, I remember there was a bookstore across the street from the high school, and I stole some pornography, some magazines from the bookstore mm -hmm. because I was too embarrassed to walk up to the cash register and actually pay for them. Mm -hmm. And because I was the, you know, rabbi's kid and, uh, you know, I was worried that if somebody would see me buying this, then that would spread and then dad could get fired and we'd have to move again. And it was just, right. It was easier just to, just to steal and, you know, live with the consequences. And um, I did start paying for it once I moved to college in New York and that felt a little more, you know, I could be a little more anonymous there and didn't care mm -hmm. what the people on the newsstands had to think. Mm -hmm. um, but that was, that was the world I grew up in. And, you know, many people are what they call cross addicted and I certainly am, right? We are addicted to multiple things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was food, it was skin picking, it was hair and bullying, it was pornography, it was love addiction and fantasy, it was gaming and checking my email 26 times a day because maybe somebody needs me to do something and I can do something for somebody else. Because, mm -hmm. amazingly enough, when I did for other people, I felt better about myself. Yeah. 
I was alone with myself, I felt totally miserable and useless. Right. Right. Yeah. That helpy helperton, the sunny side of control, I call it. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. So that was my high school and my upbringing. And I made it into college somehow and went to school in New York City and had some challenges. I had some some learning challenges that got me in trouble. And I was kicked out of college twice for lying to people. I would, I would be the best student in class and I couldn't write papers. And I just, I struggled and I put so much pressure on myself and I procrastinated and I couldn't ask for help. And I lied about it because in my house that I grew up in, you couldn't actually speak the truth because you get yelled at for speaking the truth. So it was just easier to lie to try and get out of it. Right. Except as it turns out, there are consequences for lying. I had to learn. Yes. And I'm glad that I did. <laughs> Right. I took some time off in the middle. I had a bit of a uh, challenging time, but did finish college. I did start dating someone in college and we were together for about four and a half years. And um, and we were engaged to, and she was the first person I was ever with. And I was like, oh my God, I finally found the person, right? Except I was a mess, right? Mm -hmm. I was a total dysfunctional mess on the inside. On the outside, I was this like kind and considerate and compassionate, you know, mm -hmm. student and everybody thought I was, you know, helping my mother all the time. And I was, you know, uh, becoming, I was planning to become a rabbi and like on the outside, everything was great, right? Nobody would know. And on the inside, there was, there was a lot to struggle with. So mm -hmm. uh, my fiance called it off and, um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad she did because I, w I certainly had no business, you know, getting married at that time. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to her. You know, fast forwarding a little bit, I finished college. I, you know, what really started me on this healing journey was when I was 20, I was in college and I got an email advertising a, cross-country Jewish environmental bike ride from Seattle to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And I was not a bike rider. I didn't know anything about the outdoors. I'd probably never slept at a tent. And I had no idea what I was getting myself into. <laughs> but I decided to do it. And it totally changed my life. And I found a deeper connection to God in the outdoors than I do in buildings. Mm -hmm. right? And I found a community of people who could handle me and where I could just be myself and where I felt cherished and valued. Mm -hmm. And that led after college to becoming an environmental educator at a number of Jewish retreat centers. And I, and I loved it. I really thrived in that environment mm -hmm. and, and being connected to the outdoors and a wonderful community of people. And that lasted for a couple of years and I had a few relationships, but I was still eating and you know, using a lot of pornography and doing all these things. And fast forward again, I I decided after I after I finished my time there as an environmental educator, I, I became my mother's caregiver for two years and took care of her, helped her through her second liver transplant. And that was not easy by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. And I, I I learned more about hospitals and healing and healthcare than I ever wanted to know. Mm -hmm. And it was really touch and go for a while, but I, I was committed to being with her and I stayed with her for two years. She did eventually pass away. And afterwards I had to pick myself up and say, okay, what now? Mm -hmm. And the answer was rabbinical school. And I, I did go to rabbinical school and, and, and when I was in rabbinical school, I was meeting great people and I was taking amazing classes and I was still acting out in all of these ways. And when I, in, in, in 2010, the school I was in required each of us to do a unit of what's called clinical pastoral education in a hospital or healthcare setting. Mm -hmm. And so I did this unit. I was, I was living in New Jersey, working as a congregational rabbi, still in school, but already working. And I did this, I did this training program and we had a month long healing unit on addiction. And they, they, played videos for us and they invited us to pay attention to the kinds of questions that the people in the movie were asking and to see the consequences of what a life of addiction is or could be. Okay, so I'm watching these videos and I'm hearing the questions they're asking 
and I'm seeing the negative consequences of addictive behavior. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, hang on a minute. Some of the questions they're asking are the same kind of questions that I ask. And what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that I understood that I myself could possibly be an addict. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything about addiction. I mean, you know, my mother taught me that I was not allowed to drink alcohol and drugs were not allowed in our house. Mm -hmm. And that's all I knew. Right. And I'm sure from her perspective, that was probably all she knew too. Right. right? But I had no idea that all of these other issues could be a thing. So I, I was dating someone at the time and, and she had some, some wisdom around recovery issues. And I, I came like I, all I could sort of hold at that point was okay. I'm addicted to food. Mm -hmm. I'm addicted to sugar. Clearly, I'm eating all the time, and that's not good. <laughs> and I started. I saw a functional medicine doctor who who did some blood work and testing, and and told me that I am addicted. That I was addicted, and I'm also allergic to gluten and flour and dairy and sugar and I had to go off all of those things which mm -hmm. if you're addicted to all of those things is not a fun process but I did <laughs> right <laughs> and I started exercising a little bit and I started going to some recovery meetings here and there but it didn't quite really take mm -hmm. fast forward a little bit finished rabbinical school got married we moved together to Memphis to co-rabbi at a synagogue and things didn't go so well there that's when things really shifted mm -hmm. and we didn't work well together and uh, and the synagogue was not an easy place to work when when we started and and i uh, you know i was just getting worse by the day and the marriage was not was not what i thought because what i thought was i found a nice jewish woman a rabbi no less mm -hmm. and i thought if i just put her on a pedestal give her everything she wants like I'll be happy, right? That's <laughs> what I thought would happen. And that's yeah. not exactly what happened. I right. mean, I was in some <laughs> ways, but I was still miserable in other ways. Well, and it makes sense because when you're trying to give somebody else everything they want, that's a huge amount of pressure that you're putting on yourself because you're putting their happiness on your shoulders. To say nothing of, you know, <laughs> 250 families of a synagogue that I right? was also trying to keep happy. Yes. Right, right. And how many of us out in the world do that? We're constantly trying to keep somebody else in our life or many other people in our life happy. And it is, it's, it's exhausting. It, it sucks it, it, the life out of us. <laughs> it is absolutely exhausting. Yes. And, and, and to be fair, like, I helped create that dynamic, right? I'm not blaming her for that. Like I helped, I came into the relationship doing that. Yes. And I just thought that that was what you were supposed to do. And it turns out that that was not the mm -hmm. healthiest advice uh, as right. I learned. So I started going to a therapist. Therapist sent me to a week-long retreat at a place called Onsite outside Nashville. They have a healing trauma program. Okay. And so didn't tell anyone from the synagogue because rabbis aren't supposed to have issues or ever talk about them publicly. And I just went. And that's when things really, uh, that's when I understood what was happening here. Because at that week of healing, first of all, they took away my cell phone so that I could have no outside contact and I couldn't distract myself with solitaire or minesweeper or anything else or email <laughs> or Facebook. Right. Yeah. And they, there were nine of us and a therapist that week. And I learned all about adverse childhood experiences. And I learned about, you know, emotions and boundaries and what happens when those are not mm -hmm. healthy. And I learned that the more adverse childhood experiences you have, the more likely you are to have picked up some unhealthy coping mechanisms that yes. may have served you well then, yes. but probably <laughs> are not serving you well now. Right. <laughs> and, and I, you know, my mind was totally blown open because I went there thinking, okay, I got this issue with food and I left there thinking, oh my God, it's not just food. It's all of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and, and I understood though that, that there was a way forward, right? That I, 
you know, I'm a little slow sometimes, but once I know that there's work for me to do, like I want to do it because I don't want to keep suffering, right? I mean, mm -hmm. what what the therapist said was, you know, you got to do the work of recovery and go to meetings and find a sponsor and start taking ownership for your own life instead mm -hmm. of letting other people direct it for you. Yes. And that was incredibly valuable advice. And I did, I, I, I went home and I found a few weeks later, I was at the Memphis Public Library and they have a used bookstore within the, within the library there. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at the addiction section and there was a book called Facing Love Addiction by Pia Melody mm -hmm. that basically fell off the shelf into my hands. It, it just sort of had to pick me, you need to read me. Mm -hmm. And I took it home and I read the whole thing in two days and I did not understand how she was inside my head without ever having met me. Yeah. Right. And the clearly, universal experience. <laughs> indeed. Yes. <laughs> so I, I shortly thereafter, I found a sponsor. I started doing a lot of phone meetings. I wouldn't go to in-person meetings for a good while because I was worried that somebody would see me Mm -hmm. And I'd be outed in the community and lose my job. And the marriage was not well and, and, and ended. My, my ex decided to leave town and she did. And I stayed there on my own. Mm -hmm. I did eventually start going to meetings and I was seen. And I just said, okay, God, if you want this to work, then the person who just saw me needs to keep their mouth shut. And as far as I know, they did. <laughs> um, and I started going to the gym three times a week. And I started, you know, I stayed in therapy and I worked with a spiritual director and an emotional healer and, you know, started doing the hard work of the steps of recovery with a sponsor. And ate better and organized my life a lot better and, you know, was still working too many hours at the synagogue and, but I was doing good work and I was feeling better about myself and things got a little better there. Mm -hmm. And amazingly enough, as I got better, the synagogue did too. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah. And, um, you know, really said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna own this life that is mine mm -hmm. because, you know, some of the things I learned as a kid, don't serve me well anymore and I can outgrow them and I can make better decisions for me now as a yeah. responsible adult. Yes. And, and, and I, you know, thank God it's been, you know, this December, December 19th will be five years since that mm -hmm. day in the public library. And I consider that day one of my sobriety mm -hmm. where it all really started to come together. Mm -hmm. And I don't use pornography anymore. I don't eat gluten and dairy and sugar. And I, still go to the gym and I go to recovery meetings and I've worked the steps and I'll probably do that again soon. Mm -hmm. And right. I'm doing the work of recovery and it has been such an incredible gift to find other people who are struggling with the same things mm -hmm. who can say, we know where you are. We've been there. We'll be there with you and you are valid and cherished and valued. And we don't care about all the terrible things you think you've done. Like we care that you heal. And yes. that's been really amazing for me to have the gift of recovery. That's what, that's what it has given me. Yeah. And, and I love your story and how you're able to, in hindsight, like really pick it apart and see, um, and because I am a trauma specialist and mm -hmm. I help people through their emotional healing um, I, I call myself an empowerment strategist, um, and that and that's what I do is help empower people by learning, helping them learn to um, de to manage their emotions in a very different way, and to accept their emotions when they come up instead of trying to stuff them or push them aside or, you know, um, drown them in sugar or behaviors. And behavior addictions come up a lot in the work I do with my clients, and. I loved in your story too, um, and, and I've shared this about myself in the past. Um, you talk about how you were, you know, really kind and considerate, and you know, from the outside, that's how people viewed me was kind and considerate. And I've been able to link my um, not that I'm not kind and considerate now. I'm not in the addictive side of it anymore. Sure. I have sure. the ability to say no when <laughs> something doesn't feel right to me um, or when I, you know, when I'm like, no, I'm not going to do this. Um, in the past, you know, like my kindness and consideration came from fear of getting yelled at or fear of 
you know, not pleasing somebody. So I would come across as being, oh, I'm being kind, I'm being considerate. And here I was still stuck in that childhood pattern, wasn't able to really step up and be an adult in certain situations in life. Even situations as simple as somebody asking me, where would you like to go for lunch? Um, I had a fear of choosing where somebody else would eat because mm. as a kid, if I or anybody in our family chose a restaurant and my dad's food wasn't good, then it was our fault. <laughs> mm. And we would hear about it for the whole ride home or sometimes sure. you know, spilling over into the next day. And sure. so you just learn that, oh my goodness. So it came across as, oh, let me turn this around. Well, I don't know. Where would you like to eat? Or I'm not really hungry for anything in particular. Um, what sounds good to you? And, you know, little things like that. Um, it, so it would come across as that, oh, let me be considerate of what do you want? So I don't have to make that decision. <laughs> right. And that got me in trouble a few times in my adulthood. And when I say in trouble, into situations that didn't turn out well, not that I was getting yelled at, sure. but sure. In situations that didn't turn out well. And um, one of my teachers, I'm, I'm finishing a year long course right now with Dr. Gabor Mate, who is a, an addictions expert out of Canada. And, you know, he talks about relationships, you know, you, you are going to attract people into your life who, um, I, I guess, energetically might be the word to use are where you are, you know, like mm -hmm. their level of trauma is going to be an absolute mirror of your level of trauma. So that makes sense why your relationships and mine over the years have not lasted. And, you know, eventually you do meet somebody who's at that same level of healing that you are and things can move forward in a positive way. Well, it's, it, it, it is amazing to see that. And I mm -hmm. have done a lot of work around codependency and love addiction and relationships. And I am, yeah. you know, I, I did move two years ago. I decided to leave the synagogue and I moved to Silver Spring, Maryland, and I had started dating someone long distance and we, we got married two years ago and it's yeah. much happier and healthier than I could ever have imagined. Yeah. Congratulations. You know, not without struggles, yeah. you know, yeah. marriage isn't, marriage isn't perfect, but, um, right. You know, it's, it's, it's nice to, uh, it's really nice when it works. Well, to have somebody connect with you that has a similar level of healthy coping mechanisms rather than our childhood coping mechanisms and defense right. mechanisms, you know, somebody who can handle things in from their adult self and not their child self. And, um, and I understand. And, and to also Sorry. be someone, and to also be someone who could handle some things as an adult yes. instead of as a child. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I understand that you're, you're building a movement to help people. Um, and it, it's my understanding that you're, you're targeting the Jewish community. So can you tell us a little bit about the movement that you're building? Sure. So when I was going through recovery myself, when I was still in Memphis, I was looking around to see, well, what what does the Jewish world have to say about this? Clearly, I can't be the only member of the Jewish community in the history of the last 6,000 years who's ever struggled <laughs> with this, right? I mean, I can't be that crazy. And And what I found was not a whole lot, actually. Mm -hmm. right? There's a wonderful... Jewish Recovery Center in Los Angeles that does inpatient and outpatient treatment. And they have an educators program that I went to. And I, I was there for a week and I learned great, great things that they that they're doing there. But if you're not in need of in-person treatment in LA, they're not helpful, right? They're not a national movement. Mm -hmm. Right. There was a national movement that was started in the 80s that has just not really ever taken off. And now they're very small and they do a couple programs in New York and one retreat a year and that's it. Mm -hmm. Right. But I, you know, I, I I started teaching about this when I would go to retreats and people would come up to me and they say, Oh my God, we've never heard anybody talking about this and this is our story and we need more of this. Yes. Right. And, you know, that struck a chord in me. And when I, when I moved to Silver Spring a couple of years ago, I joined the National Speakers Association here. And my speaker friend said, well, if you want to be a speaker and a coach and a thought leader, you have to write a book. And I said, well, what book do I write? And they said, well, what do you want to solve? And what do you want to work on? And what are we known for? And what came to me was this, right? This is, this is an area where 
as a coach, as a rabbi, as someone who's in recovery myself, right? Like there's, there's clearly a need for the Jewish world, for all faith traditions, of course, to, mm -hmm. to address this. And I think I have a role within the Jewish world of, of making this happen. Mm -hmm. So I wrote, I wrote a book. And God Created Recovery, available on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's gotten some nice reviews and people who've read it are really appreciating it. And, but, uh, you know, I'm not stopping there because, you know, a book is one thing. There are a few other Jewish recovery books, not many. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, why is there no Jewish recovery Facebook group? And why is there no Jewish recovery podcast? And why aren't there regular... Jewish recovery retreats in every major Jewish city in the country once or twice a year. And why is there no national Jewish sober Sabbath, right? We do breast cancer Sabbath and domestic violence Sabbath and hunger and AIDS and every, poverty and everything, right? Like why is there no recovery Sabbath? I don't know, because nobody's done that, mm -hmm. right? Why isn't there a sober Jewish cruise every summer? Sober cruising mm -hmm. is a thing. I would go on one of those, but mm -hmm. nobody's done it. So, okay, right there, I don't know why. It's just mm -hmm. nobody's ever said, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to be fair, there are people working and doing good work on, uh, on the issues of Judaism and recovery, but the national movement hasn't really taken shape yet. Okay. And some of the people doing good work are not talking to each other and they're not networking with each other. And that's a shame, right? Mm -hmm. So I started the Facebook group a few months ago. We've got, I don't know, 75, 80 members at this point. I've done very little marketing and people are starting to find it and we're having really interesting conversations and it's becoming a space where people can come in and say, I just learned this teaching that's really been interesting to me or I just relapsed and I'm feeling miserable and mm -hmm. what do I do, yeah. right? And people have been responding and supporting each other and sharing their own experience and strength and hope and it's really incredible to see. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to keep growing. And I am starting to do some marketing for all this mm -hmm. um, and putting together a coaching program and trainings for rabbis and Jewish educators and teen professionals and summer camps, because mm -hmm. we need everybody to be talking about this. And mm -hmm. we need the, the young students to know that this is, you know, these are the realities today because, you know, smoking and vaping and alcohol and drugs are so easy to access today yes right there like our high schools are saturated and yeah like I, you know am i gonna tell people that they should never ever drink anything any drop of alcohol no i'm not gonna say that but i want people to know that there are real consequences mm -hmm. i want people to know that it's up to them to decide what choices they want to make for themselves and that they can mm -hmm. choose healthier healthier things Mm -hmm. So that's what I've been working on. It's uh, It's been a little daunting to go from congregational rabbi where I had an office and a structure and, a, and I, I knew mm -hmm. my role. And now it's, you know, building this movement mm -hmm. is a whole different role. And I'm I'm learning along the way. And it's been really a gift mm -hmm. and feels feels like the kind of rabbi that I want to be. Mm -hmm. And it's been really lovely to... Yeah. you know, take my rabbi side and my coaching side and my recovery side and just put them all together and say, this is who I am and the work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And thank God the work is, is growing and it's, it's becoming what I want it to be. And that's, uh, yeah, that's great. And I'm certainly not going to stop anytime soon because there's a lot of work to do. Right. Yeah. And thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, you know, again, as a trauma specialist, this really resonates with me because when it comes to addictive behaviors, whether we're addicted to a behavior, a substance, you know, sugar, flour, gluten, alcohol, um, some illegal substance, uh, or whether it's a behavior, you know, like we're always the nice person or always mm -hmm. the healthy helperton or always the one who like goes into the rage or addicted to exercise, whatever it is, addicted to pornography. Um, it's so important if we're going to come through this to have help and to feel safe and attuned with the person that we're working with. And, you know, by really bringing this out into a national movement, um, you know, it, it kind of opens up this whole area for the Jewish community to find that safety and attunement with somebody where they might not necessarily re have that relatability to somebody in a traditional treatment facility um, or somebody who, who doesn't, you know, like me, I, I'll admit, I don't fully understand the Jewish religion. I don't fully understand the Christian religion. <laughs> I, I don't identify as religious at all. <laughs> sure. 
Um, so, uh, so somebody who, who can relate and feel safe and attuned with you. Um, that is so important to, to be relatable to, to the person that's helping guide you through your experience. Well, it's been uh, it's been a blessing so far to do this work, and mm-hmm. it's you know I'm I'm trying to build the resources that I wish had been there when I was going through this five years ago, mm-hmm. and you know if, if if it's not there, then perhaps it's my calling to to take this on, and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm you know I'm blessed to do the work, and uh, it's been an interesting journey so far, and I'm sure that will continue. Yeah, absolutely, and I believe it's our calling to you know put out into the world what we know. And right. that's exactly what you're doing. Right. right. Yeah. So tell us um, a little bit about your book um, and God created recovery. Um, does that like, have you already talked about it with your story or is there something in there that we've missed so far? So what I do in the book is I talk, is I do share my story mm-hmm. and I also, I work through the 12 steps from a Jewish lens. Okay. Right? And I give extra commentaries and I give coaching exercises and tips and things that have worked for me and others that I'm aware of so that people can have some extra support as they're working the program. Mm-hmm. I also share Jewish teachings about addiction and about healing mm-hmm. because as it turns out, this is not a new Jewish problem, right? People <laughs> right. have been, you know, if you, mm-hmm. if you study the Torah from the very beginning of time, people have been <laughs> doing some disobedient things and mm-hmm. eating things they weren't supposed to eat. And uh, mm-hmm. Noah, after the, after he comes off the ark, gets drunk, mm-hmm. right? And there is the inappropriate sexual behavior, you know, in mm-hmm. the Torah. And, you know, I'm not advocating any of that, of course, but what I'm saying is that this is not new, mm-hmm. right? right. It's, it's new that we don't talk about it. I mean, I'm not sure we've ever really talked about it, but we do have sources going back thousands of years. And I, and I bring some of those because I want people to know that this is not foreign to Jewish life, right? Mm-hmm. The old, there's an old expression in the Jewish world that says in, in Yiddish, it says a shikr is a goy, which means an alcoholic is a non-Jew, mm-hmm. which is to say, we don't have these problems. Mm -hmm. Right. This doesn't affect the Jewish world. And what I'm trying to say is, actually, this (laughs) has been affecting the Jewish world for thousands of years. Right. Right. And when we ignore this issue, then the people who have this issue Mm -hmm. feel unsupported by the community that should be helping them. Yes. And and so that's so I so I do that in the book. I talk about why the Jewish world generally doesn't talk about it and why we need to. And then I do my best to give as much, you know, practical coaching and recovery guidance and also some inspiration for when it gets hard, because of course it's going to get hard, right? The the 12 step journey is not easy and, you know, people need support and strength. I certainly did. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I, what I, what I do in the book and, um, and thank God it's been, it's been wonderful to, you know, I can hold up a book and say, look, I wrote a book, right? It's a real thing. <laughs> and um, that's, you know, that's very nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and um, so where do you see this movement going? I know right now you said you have a Facebook page. Um, your website is under construction. The um, website, God willing, will be live within the next couple of weeks. Um, mm-hmm both rabbion.com and godcreatedrecovery.com and our jewishrecovery.com will all connect to each other. Okay. Uh, but I want, right. I, I want there to be a, you know, I want there to be more resources around every Jewish holiday, mm-hmm. right? Because holidays are often very triggering for people in any faith tradition. Yes. Right? <laughs> and, 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 and we don't have those resources in the Jewish world, mm-hmm. but I want there to be, you know, phone meetings or zoom meetings or Skype meetings, whatever they are that people can go to a couple times a week, right? Mm-hmm. Probably eventually within the different fellowships right now, I'll start with anyone, but right. Certainly have a, a meeting for Jews and recovery from food and alcohol and drugs and all the different ones. Mm-hmm. Right? I want training programs and I've, I've done some trainings of rabbis already and Jewish educators, but I want a lot more of that. All right. I want it to not be okay that any rabbinical school doesn't teach rabbis about addiction. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, ditto Kanders and other Jewish educators and other professionals. Right? I want it to also not be okay for any Jewish conference to take place without having recovery meetings. Mm-hmm. Right, and that is 
probably the case that the vast majority of them, some of them do, right? Yeah. Some of them have, have gotten it, uh, but many of them, right, still, this is foreign and we don't know how to do this, so we're not doing it, right? I want the Jewish world, I want synagogues to host more recovery meetings themselves, mm -hmm. right? The vast majority of recovery meetings happen in churches, mm -hmm. which makes a lot of Jews uncomfortable. Yes. And I myself am certainly willing to go to a church for recovery meetings and almost all rabbis would say that it's allowed, um, but it does, right? It does make a number of people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, my response to that is to say, great, then the Jewish world should host meetings too, right? There was a Christian world doesn't have a monopoly on this, right? We just need to be willing to open our space and figure out how to, how to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And I want there to be a network so that they're all talking to each other and figuring out best practices and, and learning together. And I want there to be a, you know, and again, as I mentioned before, an annual sober or recovery Sabbath. And I want there to be trainings and online webinars that people can access and coaching programs that I'm starting to build out and, and the cruises and podcasts and, and, and everything else that, you know, I just want to give people an opportunity to understand that this is totally okay. This is permissible. This is necessary for healing. And I'm not advocating any one particular healing path, mm -hmm. right? Some people need medication. Some people don't. Some people need rehab. Some people don't. Some mm -hmm. people work 12 steps. Some people don't. Great. Doesn't bother me, mm -hmm. right? I want as many paths open to people as possible yeah. so that they can choose for themselves what works for them. Yes. Yeah. And that is so important. Um, and in order to um, figure out what works for you personally, we have to divert our attention inward instead of outward. For sure. So many of us in the world are outwardly focused, worried about what other people are going to say, what are other people going to think. Um, and for recovery to work, whatever the addiction is, um, the focus has to turn inward on what can I do? How, how can right. I help myself? Um, and how can I find somebody who can help me help myself rather than how can you do something that will fix me? Um, right. Subtle difference <laughs> and yet major, major difference. For sure. A very important difference at that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, this, like, I'm excited for your movement. I really am. And I see, um, you know, and I see as a trauma specialist, all the trauma, like the early childhood trauma that goes into the behavior and the addiction. Mm -hmm. And um, there really isn't a cohesive movement in the Jewish communi community or otherwise about what you're talking about. Um, so how open are you to accepting people from other religions, denominations, or even secular? So I'm I'm absolutely open to anyone who wants to be a, a part of this movement, and you know I welcome you know anyone who wants to join the Facebook group and and learn what we have to say is totally welcome to do so. Right, we don't allow proselytizing from any other religious tradition, right? But anyone is anyone who wants to be a part of this movement is absolutely welcome to to do so. Okay. And I'm happy to speak about this. You know I I do speak about this from a from a secular perspective as well, right? I'm happy to bring this wisdom to churches, to mosques, to community centers, anywhere anywhere that will have me. I'm happy to, to be connected with anyone. There's a lot of people doing good work out there. I'm happy to, you know, connect with others who are doing so. And we just, you know, we need as many resources as we can possibly get these days. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to bring, you know, what I've, what I've created anywhere. So absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. And um, and we still have a few minutes left. I'm wondering if you can give um, any action steps that somebody listening, if they if they can relate and they recognize themselves in anything that they've heard today, um, are there any steps that somebody can start to take immediately to real you know to start to work on themselves? Sure. Uh, and the interim between discovering that, oh my gosh, I might have this issue and actually getting into a program that can be helpful. Right. So the best thing I would say is start reading about it. Start listening to recovery podcasts, start connecting with other people in recovery. And, you know, maybe it's a conversation with your clergy person, if you have one, mm -hmm. maybe it's a conversation with a therapist, if you have one, or even it's maybe it's just a best friend and saying, you know, I'm really learning about this and I'm thinking that there might be some work for me to do, mm -hmm. right? And and just 
you know, to be able to speak out loud the things that we keep hidden Mm -hmm. is a real challenge, Mm -hmm. but also a real blessing. Yes. And the more we share, the more we find people who are willing to just listen to us and support us, the better things we'll get. Now we have to choose those people wisely because not everyone (laughs) wants to hear what we have to say and some people will be triggered and that's their great, that's their stuff, Mm -hmm. right? But finding people who are willing to to just listen Mm -hmm. and to help support you are, are, are incredibly valuable. And so what I would also say is Right. If you're, if you think that these might be issues of yours, you know, first of all, anyone's welcome to reach out to me. I'm happy to give out my email address and I would be more than happy to, to connect with any of your listeners. Mm -hmm. Um, But I would also say that I think the question is, right. If I am doing behaviors that don't serve me, why am I doing them? Like what's actually underlying the, like, why is this a habit in my life? Mm -hmm. right and there are ways to break habits it's not easy but there are ways to do so and I share some of those in my book and right I think the big question is what am I trying to get but how is my addiction serving me Mm -hmm. now that's a crazy question to ask because people will say it's (laughs) not right it's not and yet if we look more closely Mm -hmm. our addictions actually serve us right so for example Right. Again, what did I learn? There's no emotion that can't be solved with the right amount of sugar, Mm -hmm. i.e. I'm sad. I want to feel better. Mm -hmm. I eat something. Yes. And I feel better until I don't. Yeah. Until the sugar wears off and it starts hitting those little dopamine receptors in the brain. (laughs) Right. But I'm actually getting something Mm -hmm. from the sugar. So the real $64,000 question, as it were, is how can I identify what my addiction is giving me. Mm-hmm. And then if it's something that I actually want, how can I get it in a healthier way? Yes, absolutely. And for that, right, start going to the gym, start exercising, start meditating or praying, go for a walk, spend time in nature, mm-hmm. find a group of friends, go to recovery meetings, find a sponsor, read my book, right? Find mm-hmm. a coach, right? All of that. Yeah. I, and, and I will say that it takes a team of people to keep mm-hmm. me going straight. And some days are better than others, right? I'm not going to pretend that my life is perfect now. Far from it, mm-hmm. right? But there is a whole crew of people that I can reach out to when things aren't going as I want them to do. Yeah. And I can make better choices today, right? I mean, the reason that I know recovery works is that when my when my mother died, I was a total mess when I was eating my way through my emotions when I was watching pornography and picking at my skin and mm-hmm. you know playing solitaire until the wee hours of the morning because at least I could feel good about something for a second mm-hmm. right and when my father died a year and a half ago, I didn't do any of those things. Mm-hmm. I went to meetings, I called my sponsor, I checked in with my wife, I went to therapy I went to the gym, I listened to a lot of music, and I was able to just sit and be and process my emotions in a much healthier way. Mm -hmm. That's how I know this works. Yes. Yeah. And you are so spot on about, uh, you know, about everything you've said. Um, And we turn to our addictions. Um, Most people will discover if they haven't already, that we turn to our addictive behaviors or substances or whatever the addiction is, because it's too difficult to be present with ourselves mm-hmm. emo- with whatever emotion is coming up in the present moment. So yep. we have to avoid. And I, I'm saying all the time on my podcast with my clients, um, you have to understand, go within and understand your own motivations. So there's nothing wrong with taking a nice hot essential oil, Epsom salt, baking soda bath before you go to bed know why you're doing it. Are you doing it because you're so frustrated and that's your avoidance of your frustration? Or are you doing it because it really is a resource that helps you sleep better? Are you going out to exercise because it's avoidance of the discomfort that you feel and you're addicted to that runner's high or you know that workout high or the zone that you get into whenever you're exercising? Are you, are you doing it because you're avoiding and addicted to that, or are you doing it because it truly is, you know, mood management, emotional management, something that you get pleasure from. 
And only you can answer that. I can't say from the outside looking in what your motivations are. Right. So it is so important. And I, I think it was Socrates who said the unexamined life isn't worth living. And, yep. and I think what he meant from that, you know, again, being a trauma specialist, if we don't examine our lives, this hidden control panel controls our life. Those things, those, that avoidance, um, it controls our life because, you know, like you always in the pursuit of sugar to avoid what you were really feeling. Um, or, you know, like me, I would, I had this tendency to hijack conversations. Like if you call somebody and you have a problem or you need to talk about something or you just need to vent, it's a way to hijack a conversation and hold somebody hostage. <laughs> so somebody right. will listen to you. Cause I had this perception my whole life that nobody listens to me. Nobody cares. Nobody, nobody gives a crap about what I have to say. And it was really addictive to find a way to get into a conversation. Um, and I, I have to check myself and I'm constantly asking myself now, even when I'm talking to friends, why am I talking to my friend? Is this because I really have something I want to share or is it because I need some sort of external validation um, right. in order to feel better about myself? And every now and then I still catch myself going back into <clears throat> that needy little girl who needs that validation. And then I have to interrupt myself and I'm like, Oh, Jen, just shut up. <laughs> just <laughs> shut up. So it is, it's a, it's a lifelong work. We never fully ever get there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, often people will ask me and they'll, they'll say, well, have you recovered now? And I'm like, <laughs> well, I've done a lot of good work. I'm a lot better than I am. And yeah. you don't get recovered. You get better. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And even my, um, even my instructor in my class, Dr. Mate, um, you know, he talks about, he's, he's in his mid seventies now, and he even talks about how on a regular basis, you know, he's constantly working on himself and, you know, he's like, you know, even two years ago, he was talking about this conflict he had with his wife and how that was a childhood trauma that was feeding into his behavior in, in that moment. And, you know, and obviously they got through it and, and at the same time, recognizing it. And if we don't look at ourselves, we'll never see it. We'll never recognize it. And that will control us. For sure. Yeah. So I, I think the most important thing I would, I would tell people is that we can't do this work on our own. Right. Right. We are hardwired for community. We need community and we need other people to be on this journey with us. It's too hard. You can't, you can't do this work on your own. Right. And the gift of recovery is finding other people that will, that will help us through. There's yes. a, there's a wonderful story from the Talmud, which is kind of Jewish law from several thousand years ago about someone, a, a student of a teacher is ill in a bed. Right. And the teacher goes in to see the student and the teacher says, but do you want to be sick? Do you value your suffering? Mm -hmm. Right. And the student says, no, nope, I value neither the suffering nor the reward. I don't want to be sick. And the teacher says, give me your hand. Mm -hmm. And he picks him up and he heals him. How he does that, the story doesn't say, but mm -hmm. he heals his student. Mm -hmm. Right. Later on, the teacher himself becomes sick. Mm -hmm. And he is lying in a bed and somebody else goes to visit him. Mm -hmm. And the somebody else asks him the same question. Do you value your suffering? And he said, no, I don't value the suffering nor its reward. I want to be better. And he says, give me your hand. And he picks him up and he heals him. Mm -hmm. So the rabbis ask, why is it that if the teacher could heal the student, why did he need somebody else to heal him when he was sick? Mm -hmm. Couldn't he have healed himself? And the rabbis answer, a prisoner cannot free themselves from prison, but depend on other people to release them from their shackles. Yes. And it's totally true. We uh, need other people. And, and, yeah. and, you know, my wish for all of us is that we become the people who help free other people and ourselves yes. from our shackles. Yes. Right? And I if we're not willing to accept help from other people in our own struggles, there's no way we can be effective in giving it. For sure. There's, there's just no way. So uh, there, there's a, a lesson in that as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I love that story. Thank you for sharing. Um, so do you mind sharing your email or the best way um, that you would prefer for listeners to reach out to you? Um, sure. No, I'm happy to do that. Um, right now, the best way to get a hold of me, Rabbi Elon at TorahOfLife.com. Torah of Life is the name of my podcast. So I, I okay. use that email for a number of things and people are welcome to send me an email. Okay. People can also find me on Facebook, 
Elon Glazer. There's there's only two Elon Glazers in the world. The other one's in South Africa. I'm not that one. Okay. But, um, and then people are welcome to go to facebook.com slash groups slash Our Jewish Recovery to find the group that I have there. And you do have to apply and agree to the rules to join. It's, you know, there's three questions. It takes, you know, 30 seconds. But if people do want to hear more about that work and how Jewish wisdom can help people in recovery from whatever addiction and from whatever faith background or none anyone is a part of, I do welcome people joining and I'll be happy to connect with anyone who wants to talk to me, email, Facebook, in the group. And however okay. I can be a resource, I'm happy to do so. Okay. And I'll make sure I put those links up as well. And Great. when is your podcast? Um, is there a day of the week or you know, what day does it go, go up? So the tour of life podcast is coming back soon. It's been a little oh. bit on hiatus since I started writing the book. Cause I just couldn't do them all at the same time. Fair but enough. The, pod- <laughs> yeah, the podcast is coming back very soon within the next couple of weeks. And then hopefully I will, my goal is to release a couple episodes a week. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Okay. Fantastic. But, uh, ep- episodes are, there's about 50 or 60 episodes available on iTunes already. And people are welcome to subscribe and, mm-hmm. and tell me what they think. Love hearing about it. Okay, fantastic. Well, Rabbi Elon, um, before we sign off, do you have any final tips or bits of wisdom to leave with our listeners today? So the final piece of wisdom I would say is one of the teachings that has that has gotten me through some days is that there's a teaching that says the day you were born is the day God decided the world couldn't go on without you any longer. And this is a really difficult teaching for some people, because for those of us who are so used to putting ourselves down, Mm -hmm. we need to also know that we're here for a reason, Mm -hmm. right? Some people like to say, God, God, don't, don't create no mistakes, right? (laughs) Which is one way of putting it, right? But, you know, my therapist Mm -hmm. said to me, you know, my soul is a gift from God to the world. Mm -hmm. Right? And, I, and I want people to know that, right? That each of us, no matter what we've done, no matter what our struggles, no matter what addiction we have, right? If we're still here, if we're still breathing, there is work for us to do. And it's because we're meant to be here. And it's because there's something valuable inside of us. And I think the best thing we can do is to start figuring out that question, why am I here? Mm-hmm. What's the work that that I'm here to do and how can I help serve other people? Because in a world that is so filled with violence and addiction and craziness today, Mm -hmm. we all have opportunities to be the people who are helping other people heal. And I think that for me is when I best come alive, right? When I can do this work that helps other people be the best people they can be, that is such a gift to help other people become free from their past and to help them find peace and joy for the future, I think is the greatest gift that anyone could give anyone else. So I would, I would just sort of bless all of us, everyone Mm -hmm. listening and, and hopefully myself as well, that we become those people who become guideposts for others because we can, and it's important Mm -hmm. and we are more powerful than we think. And our struggles don't have to define us. And tomorrow can certainly be better than today if we're willing to make that happen. So I hope that for all of us, we can find the strength to keep going and to live well. It's beautiful. Thank you so much, Rabbi Elon. And for all of our listeners, um, again, if you want to find out more about me or what I do, go to jenniferwhitaker.com. And I'm signing off for this week, and I will see you all again next week on Yes And. We have just concluded another episode of the Yes And podcast with Jennifer Whitaker. For additional resources, please visit our website, jenniferwhitaker.com. Leave a review if you enjoyed the show and find it useful. Until next time, continue challenging conventional thinking and keep moving forward.